Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ocean Acidification Week 2020, a virtual multi-day forum to highlight ocean acidification research and initiatives. This is session three, the North American OA Hub. OA Week is presented by GOON, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the IAEA OAICC, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center, and by the IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. We are so glad to have uh, over 229 pre-registrants for this session, and we see right now that there's over 110 people joining us, and we hope that the rest join um, over the next couple minutes. My name is Michael Aquafreda, and I work with the GOON Secretariat. I'm also a Canals Fellow working with the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, and I'll be moderating today's session. During the presentation, all participants are in listen-only mode. You are welcome to type any questions into the question box, which can be found at the bottom of the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. You can also post questions on Twitter using the hashtag OAWeek2020. Make sure to call out which speaker you're directing your question to, either in your question box or on Twitter. We'll be monitor monitoring incoming questions and we'll pose them to our speakers during the question and answer section at the end of this webinar. Um, or we will hold the questions and um, start a thread on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available through the Go On YouTube channel soon after OA Week concludes. Before we hear from our speakers, I would like to share a short presentation about Go On. Go On is a collaborative international network designed to address three high level goals. The first is to improve our understanding of global ocean acidification conditions. The second is to improve our understanding of ecosystem response to OA. The third is to acquire and exchange data and knowledge necessary to optimize modeling for OA and its impacts. GOON is an active organization that offers numerous resources to its members. GOON informs policy at the international level. Uh, Go on members assisted with the development of the SDG indicator 14.3.1 methodology, which provides guidance on how to measure ocean acidity and how to report the collected information. The SDG 14.3 is one of the 10 targets for the UN Sustainable Development Goal 14 to build towards the 2030 sustainability agenda. Go on also interacts with the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and the Commonwealth Blue Charter. Go on also offers a a uh, scientific mentorship program called Peer to Peer. Peer to Peer matches senior researchers with early career scientists to facilitate an exchange of expertise and to provide a platform for international collaborations. It also offers scholarships and trainings. Goan also offers a data explorer, which provides access and visualization to OA data and data synthesis products, which are being collected from around the world using a variety of sources, including moorings, research cruises, and fixed time series stations. Finally, GoOn produces webinars like today. Uh, this is the newest resource that GoOn offers, uh, and Ocean Acidification Week is the kickoff. After OA Week comes to a close, OA uh, webinars uh, hosted by GoOn will occur every four to six weeks. If you have any ideas about what you would like to hear uh, about during these webinars, please type them into the chat box. GOON has eight regional hubs, and we'll be hearing from most of them throughout OA Week. Overall, GOON has over 750 members from over 100 countries. Join GOON today at the GOON website. Initially, the fifth international symposium on the ocean in a high CO2 world was scheduled to take, pl take place this week in Lima, Peru. Yet like many other events scheduled for this year, the symposium was postponed until 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This symposium would have brought together researchers, decision makers, and other stakeholders to share cutting edge OA science. We're looking forward to that and hope everyone listening today will visit the symposium website and learn more. We hope to see you in Lima, Peru in September, 2021. We have an excellent list of speakers 
joining us today, and we'll hear from them in just a few moments. They include Wiley Evans from Canada, Piero Colosi, also from Canada, Jose Martin Hernandez Ayon from Mexico, Cece Chapa from Mexico, Adrian Sutton from the United States, and Nina Benarsik, also from the United States. Before we hear from our speakers, I'd like to give you a little bit more information about the North American Hub. To talk about the North American Hub, I'd like to introduce Dick Feely, a co-chair of the North American Hub. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you great, Dick. Yes, great. North American Hub started in 2017, and it's composed of nearly 100 members. Uh, and we had our first meeting in uh, Vic Victoria, Canada in 2018, and our most recent meeting on Hidalgo, uh, Mexico at the University Del Mar. Our um, major efforts to date have been to co coordinate on data collection during cruises, to develop the exchange platform through the GoOn data portal, development of the North American Hub webs webpage, create a data synthesis paper for the region around North America, support new data synthesis technology, and develop a long-term strategy for certified reference materials, and, and finally to encourage studies uh, between students and faculty members of different nations. We are a very active group, and this is picture here shows the uh, meeting that we had in December 2019. I'll turn it back to you, Mike. Thank you so much, Dick. At this time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today, Wiley Evans. Thanks, Mike. Um, just going to share my screen here. And are you seeing the first slide? So we're just seeing a white screen at the moment, but uh, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to load. Here it is. Okay, here it is, perfect. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, as Michael mentioned, my name is Wiley Evans. I'm a research scientist with the Hackeye Institute. And for my uh, 10 minutes, I'm gonna sort of run you through a highlight reel of uh, some activities that are taking place along the British Columbia coast uh, that are providing insights into uh, CO2 patterns, both from a modeling and, and observational perspective. And I should say that there are many contributors uh, to this talk that I will try and highlight um, along the way. And so I'm going to start with sort of our large scale view. This is a, a, a modeling results from Am Amber Holtzworth and Jim Christian and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, and these are results from their Canadian Ocean Ecosystem model. Uh, the model domain is shown in the figure on the left. And I have a little red bar coming off of Vancouver Island and going south representing uh, the area of a section that the data on the right are from. And so the multiple panels on the right are organized in the multiple, the figure on the right is organized in multiple panels with the left panel being a historical climatology. This is a, this is a climatology based on conditions around 2003. And then the two panels on the right are sort of future ocean climatologies centered around the year 2055 for two different emission scenarios. And so for each of these panels, on the top we have density, and we have uh, aragonite saturation state, uh, pH, and oxygen content. And what I want you to get from this slide is that irrespective of the emissions trajectory, we can expect more corrosive conditions over the continental shelf with a shallower saturation horizon, that's the saturation state equal one level, with lower pH conditions and lower oxygen conditions. Again, irrespective of the emissions trajectory, we're locked into uh, this um, pattern over the next couple decades. Um, from our open ocean time series sites, this is largely driven by Fisheries and Oceans Canada. This slide is uh, provided by Debbie Einson and highlights a new paper that came out last month led by Tatiana Ross, uh, where they analyzed uh, measurements collected along Line P, which is a hydrographic station that runs from western Vancouver Island out to Station Papa in the North Pacific. And it's an amazing time series uh, with the top panel showing oxygen content from the surface to 3,000 meters, 
going from roughly 1960 to the present day. And the panel below that is the aragonite saturation state, again, zero to 3,000 meters, starting in around 1990. So nearly three decades of inorganic carbon data for this site. And it shows patterns that are consistent with the modeling work. These authors are highlighting um, the saturation state equal 0 0.7 isopleth in this orange here, and it's shoaling at about one to two meters per year. And at the same time, the oxygen minimum zone is growing. And so we're seeing consistent patterns with the modeling, decreasing oxygen content largely, and, and more corrosive conditions uh, uh, in the water column. As we move towards the shore, um, it's, we, we have very few places where we can resolve rates of change because our time series are not yet long enough. I do want to highlight there is a really nice paper by Worrell et al. 2018 that came out in Nature Communications where they did analyze data from the surface ocean CO2 atlas and, and looked at pixels west of Vancouver Island where there were long enough time series to assess rates of change. But largely over our region, the time series are not are not that long yet. But we are generating some really fantastic time series that are providing information on the variability. And this is one example uh, of those. These are data from a ship of opportunity, uh, the Alaska Ferry Columbia, which runs from Bellingham, Washington, the United States, all the way along the coast of British Columbia up into Southeast Alaska. The figure on the bottom shows uh, aragonite saturation state in color with the latitude as the y-axis, longitude as the x-axis, and time as the z-axis. And so each line is a single transit. And, and so what you can see here is deep red and gray color is very corrosive water. And that's typical of the enclosed Salish Sea between Vancouver Island and mainland British Columbia uh, during winter time. Um, areas of high corrosivity are also occurring to the north, especially up in Southeast Alaska. In the spring and summer, phytoplankton begin to grow and these saturation state conditions get much better. So you can see the coloration going to yellow to even blue in very high uh, saturation state conditions. And then by fall, they're coming back again. So it's a really nice picture of the variability along the coast, but you also notice there's places where the variability isn't changing much. And these are, these are areas that are persistently tidally mixed. And so they're always they always tend to be corrosive and they're not, they're not highly variable through the year. What I wanna point out with this slide is that we can take this picture of variability and help re-strategize our observing effort, especially in a COVID world where things like this ferry are not running right now. And so this panel on the right shows something called the time of detection, which is the time that you would expect a secular trend to, to emerge from a noisy data set. And the blue is areas where that time of detection is very short because these regions are not highly variable, these tidally mixed zones. And so you can see this, this pinch point between Vancouver Island and the mainland where, where the variability is low and the time to resolve a long-term trend is rather short. And so if we're thinking about you know, how to re-strategize our observing so that we can assess rates of, chan, rates of change, assess uh, having instrumentation in these places that are not that variable uh, would be advantageous, as opposed to the Salish Sea where the variability is quite high and you can see the, the time of detection is quite long. And those areas, are, are, our focus should probably be more on the processes and how those processes themselves may be impacted by climate change uh, and, and, and therefore change into the future. And so I've highlighted that the Salish Sea is, is vulnerable um, and this is consistent with most of the estuarine studies that are coming out to date that's showing estuarine areas as being more vulnerable to ocean acidification. And sort of the, the, the Canadian uh, side of the Sailor Sea, which is the Strait of Georgia, there's a growing body of literature that's showing this. And it really starts with a paper by Debbie Einstein that came out in 2016 that pointed out uh, the vulnerability of this area to ocean acidification. And then in 2019, we, we published another paper looking at CO2 patterns uh, in the Northern Salish Sea from high resolution data sets. And we assess the anthropogenic CO2 content and how it's evolved through time since the pre-industrial. And the figure on the bottom here shows the month of the year on the y-axis and year on the x-axis, starting on the left at roughly 1765 and going to 2100. And the color is the saturation state. So the more red, the more corrosive with this black line being the saturation state of equal one um, value. 
And so you can see sort of pre-1950, these wintertime surface ocean conditions that are corrosive really likely didn't occur. Um, this is sort of a, a new phenomenon over the last uh, number of decades. And going into 2100, we would expect to see changes in the summertime where we won't be reaching the highs anymore uh, that we were seeing previously. And so despite these, this area having lower anthropogenic CO2 content, it is quite sensitive. And then there's recently, as of last week, in fact, there's a new paper that just came out led by Alex Hare, where Alex took this a, a step further and looked into the fjords. And so compared two fjord systems, one on the central coast that's exposed to the open shelf and one in the Salish Sea that's getting source water from the Salish Sea. And of course, Butte Inlet, which is in the Salish Sea, is much more corrosive and vulnerable than Rivers Inlet. And the panel on the bottom highlights this, except I'm showing the calcite uh, saturation state. And so you can see there's values less than one through uh, at depth in the water column through the entire time series. And what Alex also did was back out the anthropogenic CO2 content and showed that sort of pre-1950, again, these, these values probably were not there. And so we know these settings are, are highly vulnerable. And at the same time, they're used by the shellfish aquaculture community in British Columbia, which is a really important uh, stakeholder group. And one particular area of interest is Bain Sound in the Salish Sea, where 50% of shellfish landings uh, are, occur each year. And so there's been a growing observation effort in this area. And, and recently, the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System has spun up. And this is really an opportunity to bring the data sets from these assets together and sort of reimagine how, how we provide this information to the stakeholder group. And so I've taken a couple screenshots of, of sort of a dashboard that we have under development uh, for you to see where we have this Bain Sound ecosystem monitoring dashboard. You can select these icons. And then you'll get information from each asset on the temperature, the pH, and the calcite saturation state in, in a unified fashion. And so we're hoping that this is maybe a new way of looking at these data that can be beneficial to the stakeholder community. And I provided a URL here that you can, you can go and explore if you're interested. Um, and then finally, or sorry, one more slide after this, but also a new uh, thing that we're looking forward to is uh, modeling work done by Teresa Yarkova, uh, who has added a carbon element to uh, Susan Allen's Salish Sea Cast, which is a high resolution uh, NEMO model for the Salish Sea. And so we're, this is a brand new uh, product that we're hopeful will provide nice insights into the patterns that are evolving within the Salish Sea. And so we have all these great observational and modeling products. And I, I want to end with sort of linking these observations with the biological experiments. And this is a contribution from Iria Jimenez, who is at the Hakai Institute in UBC. And, and what Iria is doing is essentially taking a time series that, that we produced in an area called Pendle Sound in British Columbia in the Salish Sea, which is a really unique area in that it is one of a few places that has a natural spawn of Pacific oyster. And, and she's running experiments on Pacific oyster using this time series, but instead of of sort of uh, targeting a brute force PCO2 level, what we're doing is we've, we've taken the saturation state trend that we observed during, uh, during the deployment in 2018, and we're manipulating it to, uh, by imparting an anthropogenic CO2 signal that we'd expect to see by 2050, recalculating the saturation state conditions, and then using that to drive the experiments. And, and, and at the same time, recreating the variability that we observed in the time series. And so I think this is a pretty novel approach of using the time series to, to, to drive the experiments. And what Iria is gonna do is actually take this a step further and not just uh, apply this technique to historical time series, but eventually wow. also use real-time data uh, coming in from our distributed observing assets up, along the, up and down the coast. And with that, I will turn the mic back over to Michael and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Wiley. Uh, our next presenter is Piero Colosi. Piero, I'm making you the presenter now. You should be able to share your screen. Okay, thanks a lot for the invitation to participate to today's discussions. Um, this talk is unashamedly inspired by um, a child children's story and it's Alice in Wonderland, so I guess you have uh, understood from the title as well as the image of the white rabbit. 
uh, I was inspired by this because uh, in uh, I used to live in the UK, uh, in particular in nearby Anthony House where Tim Burton shot the uh, one of the recent version of Alice in Wonderland movies. And so I had the opportunity with my children to wander in the Villas Park, uh, populated by giant mushrooms, uh, and even living characters of the White Rabbit, Alice, or the, um, the Cheshire Cat, and the Mad Hatter running around the gardens. And I was fascinated always by the story and by the meaning and the significance of time and timing uh, that touch uh, different, different characters. As you know, in the story, Alice is the main character, but the White Rabbit is also a very important role is in a character extremely stressed with the uh, passing of time as as much as he's stressed about losing his head uh, to the uh, a very difficult customer which is the the queens of heart if we make a parallel to the story in our uh, research reality in our research time as researchers are very much concerned with time well we would be the white rabbits and our difficult customer is global changes as much as uh, and what is important time in our story is that we fight against time. We fight against time passing every year they pass by. We see the progression of global changes. We see the transformation in the geology, the chemistry, the physics, and the biology uh, of our, our Earth system. And so as biologists, as, uh, uh, as global change biology, uh, global change scientists, sorry, we deal with time passing and we have to provide solution in a timely fashion to be able to uh, provide society the possibility to uh, adapt to these changes. Time is also of the essence when concerned our demography, which is a primary uh, primary engine of the current uh, changes in the environment in our, in our Earth system. Uh, also, in uh, uh, if you want, in a multiplicatory factor with the intensity of our activities. And um, and of course, you will agree with me that timing and time become very important when we talk about adaptive management. If we are to provide solution to uh, stakeholders and to the environmental manager and to government our researchers to be timely and arrive uh, arrive in time to be delivered in time for this uh, uh, m resolution uh, to, to come to, uh, to life. Well, since I moved to Quebec, uh, my focus area has become uh, from the Mediterranean and the west of the western coast of Europe, the east coast of North America. So me and my students will work along the coast from the US to uh, the Arctic Canada. Um, and it's a particular interesting area, as you can see here, uh, is uh, interested by a uh, high level of cumulative impacts. Um, but also, and if you take as an example, the work by William Cheng, the modeling work on fish fishing, changes in uh, species distribution and presence and abundance, we can see there is an area that will be interested by high level of diversity loss, at least in the species that currently inhabit this area, as well as a high level of turnover, uh, turnover with species arriving from the south. So it makes it into a very dynamic area, both from an environmental uh, change point of view as well as bio biological changes point of view. This area is particular, uh, particularly well uh, understood in terms of the chemistry and uh, the climate in general, um, at least uh, for what the Earth system until now. And we know that we have discrete regional area, climatic area from temper to, temper to boreal to uh, subpolar. It's an extremely dynamic area that changes with seasonality, uh, but it also is changing rapidly in terms of uh, future climate changes. We also know very well the uh, current structure uh, of species distribution and abundance, uh, thanks to a number of surveys that exist uh, across the border from uh, the US to Canada. Uh, this involving heavily, of course, the work by NOAA and uh, in the US and DFO in Canada. Uh, these species are particularly important for two well, reasons. First of all, the American lobster, which lives more south, is a warm adapted species and the first most important uh, species for fishery in Canada and of course also the most important fishery in the, the northeast of the US. And the northern prone or northern shrimps, according to uh, what it's called in different country, is a species of great interest for uh, ca Canadian economy, uh, fishing community, in fact, considered the third most important uh, fish species. And is a cold adapted species. So we expect to already to have different level of sensitivity of these two species to the ongoing changes. What we know in terms of state-of-the-art research, uh, we have accumulated over the last few years uh, sufficient, uh, sufficient information to understand that uh, species like the, the American lobster, we have very complex life cycle, present a significant different responses to acidification, for example, along the developmental tra trajectory. You can see here an extra from the work by Keppel and Waller um, that show this data 
uh, already using scenario uh, of acidification and control condition. More recently, in collaboration with uh, the St. Andrew uh, Biological um, Laboratory uh, in St. Andrew, New Brunswick, with Helen Gurney Smith, another colleague, we have conducted a similar study looking at the responses along the developmental trajectory of larval and juvenile stages that are across a, a CO2 gradient. More recently, even uh, and is not yet published, we have actually tested a gradient of uh, temperature and CO2 with the addition of different level of nutrition. This work being led by Helen Gurney Smith at SABS. So what we see in general and it's quite actually reassuring the way from a management point of view. In our preliminary study, we see that um, the responses of uh, different lar larval stages and juvenile stages, despite being quite life stage specific, are linear and therefore more easily predicted according to gradient of CO2. This makes it relevant for management of, of course, the stocks both uh, in the time gradient uh, in terms of like year by year, but also over seasons when condition in pH and CO2 uh, change uh, naturally. So what we what we actually take communities from this uh, research so far, not just ours, but also a colleague from the Wallis Lab and other laboratory in Canada and the US, is that we have life specific responses to CO2 and also to uh, uh, ocean warming. They need to be taken into account uh, in particular because until now we had kind of like ignore uh, the sensitivity of juvenile stages, which appear to be among the most sensitive uh, life stages when we go and do modeling exercise to project our results in the future. Uh, in collaboration with William, William Chang and Travis Tai at UBC, we have done such a work and integrated the response of larvae in blue, juvenile yellow and adults in orange, and also considering cumulative effects of these multiple life stages, seeing that the cumulative effects are uh, negative and more important when concerned, for example, reduction in mean size over time with the progression of uh, global changes, but also on the distribution. I would like you to appreciate the difference in sensitivity of different life stages to uh, the effect, for example, on acidification. And the fact that cumulative effect that always uh, provide the worst case scenario. So until now, in a way, by working either on adults or only on larvae, we have underestimated the impact of acidification in this sense. However, considering that acidification does not occur in isolation, but also in combination with other factors and primarily with, uh, with ocean warming, we can see that the cumulative impact of warming and acidification in the Gulf of Maine and the Gulf of the St. Lawrence are actually worse than acidification um, uh, in isolation. However, interestingly, and this because polar change will provide for other area opportunity when there's loss for some community. In the estuary of the St. Lawrence, thanks to the warming of this condition, as well as in the southern area of the, of the Gulf of um, or the St. Lawrence, we can see that we have more favorable, favorable condition in terms of maximum catch potential in terms of habitat suitability. This is, of course, is intriguing from a scientific point of view, but also raise concerns that we have to actually to use these, these approaches while they have to be, of course, uh, keep to be refined to see where we should invest in terms of uh, adaptation, where they're gonna be a loss of the species and maybe you have to shift to different target species for the fisheries and where we should actually gear up to, uh, um, to start new fisheries. There is not yet permits, for example, for uh, lobster fishing in uh, the estuary on the St. Lawrence. Despite the fact that the species has been documented in, in many cases, I find myself whilst diving uh, around uh, this area really in really high density. Um, what is important to consider that whilst we have a loss uh, in the southern range, uh, apparently, sorry, we, we, we project to have a, a loss in abundance and catch potential in the southern range of the distribution of the American lobster with important consequences for the economy of a number of area uh, of community in this area. We can't concern the state of the art of the shrimps. We are still a bit behind what it concerns combined effects. So we have a uh, um, study on acidification, only warming or hypoxia, but only more recently uh, research is emerging from the combined impact of acidification and, and uh, warming, particularly in Europe, by um, conducted by my Iron Bank in Norway, and then also by the Denisha Bo Lab at the EML here in Montjolin, Quebec. What we can see, just to summarize, like a lot of results, is that survival is worsened by uh, progressive warming, but it's made much worse when this is combined with acidification, as well as also hypoxia, which is chronic, permanently chronic in some area of the St. Lawrence, Estuary and Gulf. So what we are doing currently is to, to use these species of cold adapted uh, marine invertebrates as a, an alternate figure to the warm adapted American lobster to work across the gradient of temperature, 
with two different scenarios, which you'll see are adjusted to the reality of the habitat of this organism. So they're much lower already currently, and they're going to be much lower in the future. And we're relevant by considering uh, hypoxic condition. What we do in particular is that we are comparing different populations because the genetic heritage and the uh, acclimatization of, of each population will play a role in defining how to respond to the future challenges. So this is the work conducted that's going to be modeled in the future and compared to the, the lobster to understand how these two major players in the local economies of many regions uh, will have an effect. So what is important in the message I want to take is that we must provide much faster dynamic research frameworks uh, in terms of temporal, uh, temporal grain and also spatial grain to provide manager uh, with an understanding of what is going to ha happen region by region. This has to be, of course, well integrated with the uh, documentation of chemistry and the, and the physics of the area where we study, but to provide actually um, a more, I want to say, on live, or online, in vivo, uh, sort of like documentation of these changes. Otherwise, the changes that, the, that we can provide, the ideal changes we can provide to stakeholder would arrive like three years, five years, 10 years too late to their ability to uh, actually adapt. We need to create a fast track uh, uh, way of working, similar to what happened in the West Coast of the US and Canada with the oyster uh, uh, aquaculture, and as well as what happened, for example, with COVID nowadays, where the making available of human and, and financial resources is making research much faster. So I want to then come to a hand, uh, hoping that you're not going to use uh, the famous phrase by the hearts, uh, uh, the Queens of Hearts, off with his head, and thank you for your attention. Whilst I need to acknowledge the contribution of my uh, amazing co-worker, my student from the undergrad to the postdoc that populate my lab, and thank you. Thank you so much, Piero, for that wonderful presentation. Next up is uh, Martin hernandez Ayon. Martin, I'm going to now make you the presenter. Excellent. Could you see my screen now? Yes, we could see your screen. Excellent, excellent. Okay, thank you for the invitation. And we have this opportunity to talk a little bit about the Gulf of Mexico. The, in this case, I, I, I would like to, change, to tell you that uh, a few information reality in the last, uh, we will say that uh, after 2010, we don't have a, any numbers for the biochemistry in the, in the oceans, Mexican Ocean for the Gulf of Mexico, which is, this is uh, interesting, kind of interesting because uh, we start to know a little bit about the carbon chemistry after the disaster of the deep water horizon, where the Mexican government invite the uh, uh, oceanographic institution to participate in this area. And from the last five years, we have a big consortium related with the uh, mostly good to know them more about the ocean circulation and how the wires are moving related with the oil companies interests uh, also from the Mexican government and we have the, the opportunity to, to get numbers for the carbon chemistry in this in this area. We have now about uh, seven cruises for this area that you can see my, my screen and this is spot with the information. Uh, you will see later after my talk Cecilia will be talking about the Pacific. I just show you the two phases for the different biochemistry we have for the two oceans we have in Mexico. And this uh, plot, I share you data from Victor Camacho related with the nutrients and also from oxygen. In red, you can see the young waters from the Atlantic the Ocean versus the old waters from the ocean minimum zone that we have in the area of the Pacific. Then we have a very two phases, clear phases different by the biochemistry. And uh, of course, in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, we were suspecting uh, that uh, this as a big lagoon, coastal lagoon to be fitted by the, the Atlantic Ocean signal. But uh, you will see a, a few details about that. For example, this, this is a work coming from Smith and Richardson. They suggest about half and a half about that it's an approximation. Water coming from the north, Atlantic and also coming from the south. This means that it's not only from this area, the water, the feet, the water. Then, I, as I told you, I was expecting to understand the area of the coastal lagoon to know that and member from the ocean, 
feeding the, the area of the Gulf of Mexico to know how the, the changes could be happening inside of the Gulf. Uh, this uh, data that I showed you is coming from the WASE, 1997. This is a transit from DIC. You can see in, in colors the latitude. And uh, for example, in this case, I just take data, all the data uh, for the big basin from the Atlantic Ocean. And you can see the values, how the, the features trends from the profile that you can observe. In the deepest water, we have 21, 50, 100. But you can see in the other side, uh, water just collecting from the, the station inside of the, of the Caribbean water, when you can observe that water is rich and DIC, different. And also you can see some spot in black, very consistent, what I'm going to tell you. In the seven cruises we, we did, the water inside of the Gulf of Mexico is very quite similar to the Caribbean water. This means that maybe the calculation need to be uh, fixed and the proportion because uh, I, and based on the on view of the biochemistry, we have more water or the signal or the biochemical signal more related with the Caribbean waters. And this is important. This is DIC concentration. Then the, the first message that we got was the profile, uh, because it's not only for DIC, was also observed for, for nitrate, for nutrients, for oxygen too are very quite similar to the look like of the Caribbean water. Our friends from NOAA, also from the, the Atlantic side, we have in the Pacific, NOAA friends and also big friends from the, from the both sizes, Leti and uh, Daniels uh, in Baknikov Creek, they organized a cruise in July uh, 2017. And, uh, uh, and the same month, about uh, well, not same month, in, in June, a month before, we did another cruise from the Mexican uh, institutions. And then we, in this plot, basically what I uh, ask is all the data from the two cruises. Uh, the NOAA guys, they designed to go uh, not only in the North American area, but also in the Mexican part and also Cuba, but including the uh, coastal and ocean. But in the central part, I just add the data for the uh, our program, the Mexican program. And uh, in this plot, I highlight the total CO2 and also the state of the Aragonese saturation profile. And really, you can see that uh, consistent the data, one, but second, uh, in this case, that we have a young waters inside. In reality, we observe the lowest values between 500 meters and 1,000 meters when we have uh, uh, intermediate waters more with more respiration. And uh, this is interesting. Uh, uh, a new paper published for Fabian Gomez and uh, the people from NOAA, they did some simulations related with uh, the inorganic carbon. They validated the data based on buoy they have in the north part of the Gulf of Mexico and observation they have from the previous cruises. And they did this output related with the surface aragonite state. As you can see, basically the, the range, our lowest value is 2.6, highest 4.62, uh, but the lowest are related mostly with the Zafalaya or the Mississippi River uh, in the upper part. And then uh, the rest are in, in the highest values. But uh, I, I just point out to, to uh, observation they did related with the seasonal pattern they observed uh, and driven the omega aragonite saturation related with the changes on DAC and alkalinity where we are agree about that but also the second is reinforced by the, the temperature changes the seasonal changes then uh, I, I, I agree with that with these two points for the paper <clears throat> I just I would like to just to highlight that uh, the water is, is not static. It's not just heat up the temperature in this area. It's not, I'm going to show you that based on some observation when, by uh, Juan Antonio Delgado, part of this project. The, in this paper, basically, they, they, uh, the, uh, with this guy, we, we found something interesting related with the eddy kinetic energy matched very well with the 40 centimeters 
of the absolute dynamic topography. <clears throat> this gives oh, give us the opportunity to, uh, to show or to confirm the maximum station extension of the uh, current loops basically in summers. This means the message here that I want to show you, tell you, is this water from the Caribbeans using these tools uh, confirms, the, confirms the, the, the maximum extrusion of the Caribbean water inside. This Caribbean water is oligotrophic, low nitrates, for example, <clears throat> and we use also uh, chlorophyll to confirm that. You can see now in more blue, the summer when the maximum extension of the Caribbean current is in sight and the highest chlorophyll is in, in winter when we have this retraction of the, of, the, of the loop current. But related with the carbon, we, I can show you this result from Gabriela Cervantes, my student who divide, or he, he, he tried to, to catch up the data related with the Caribbean water. You can observe here in black, we have uh, three summers three different cruises. In black, you can see here the values inside of the loop current of the eddies, and in blue is outside, basically. Already the transition, some remaining. But again, the, the, the black one, the black ones are inside the, of the Caribbean water. You can see the influence, but this is uh, upper oxygen utilization. This means that, for example, the Caribbean, uh, used to be more uh, good values with more close to zero this means more in equilibrium with the atmosphere less res respiration versus the blue ones for example but this is the case for th three cruises of summer and you can see the we have the signal also for dic this means that more respiration we have more higher dic or the caribbean water have less dic for example and also according to the uh, density too then what's interesting to find this because uh, it's not static the dynamic inside of the Gulf of uh, Mexico, Mexico because more uh, Caribbean water inside is pumping this oligotrophic water with low chlorophyll, uh, less DIC, no nutrients and, and then the biochemistry is uh, a lot of control by the, by the mesoscale inside. Another feature that I would like to highlight is that uh, this is a report from the Horizon Marine uh, page. You can see, for example, that the message here is uh, after and before 2002, we have different recent lifetime of the eddies. And the message here is from 2002 to the present, the lifetime is about 12 months. And then <clears throat> this gives us the, the idea to explore the data from ADT again. And I show you here, basically the periods when we have the maximum incursion of the, of the loop current is after the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico and we have two phases before and after and then uh, and from 1993 to 2002 when we have data we can observe the loops of the eddies with less recent time versus the present which is uh, uh, with largest volumes of Caribbean waters that have an effect and, and then this means that we are, I, I was talking with, with you guys about the biochemistry fit by this water with low nutrients, oligotrophic water, and uh, low DIC. It's changing the inorganic carbon, the, the, the carbon system inside of the Gulf of Mexico. But also it means this food because uh, if we compare these differences, chlorophyll, this means that we, if we have more oligotrophic water inside would be an effect, not only the biochemistry, but also on the features too. And this is a, something that we, we consider very important to that. Then basically the highlight that I'm going, going to finish with this is the role of the Caribbean water is something that we have as a challenge to, to recalculate the volume because I, 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 based on the biochemistry, we have more Caribbean water feeding the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, of course, we are very pleased with the participation of the, of the NOAA. Uh, we hope we can do again another cruise uh, next year. And uh, to explore this, this part, in reality, I show you the data for the NOAA transect and also for the, our Mexican uh, station in the central part of the Gulf of Mexico. But we have 
some anthropogenic effect that we don't have time to show you, basically in the peninsula of Yucatan. And then and another challenge that we're going to have is to understand this uh, last message that I showed you is about the increase of the input of the Caribbean water inside, or the, the effect. I was talking about you with about the effect of the chlorophyll, that means food for the fisheries, and which would be the implication on that. And then I will, yes, I will say thank you to NOAA, to the government of Mexico for this opportunity to, to put numbers in these big gaps of the Mexican ocean waters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Sashi Shapa. Uh, and I actually am going to be, uh, present her slides for her. Uh, Ceci, you could go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you see your slides? Okay, when you need me to uh, progress, just say next. Okay. Invitation. Um, I will um, give you an overview of the status of studies in ocean acidification in the Pacific coast of Mexico. Uh, um, I'm the voice, but uh, I will present uh, works of mine, also of uh, other colleagues that um, have worked through the time in this area. Please. Next. Uh, in the north part of, uh, of the California Courage System, which uh, most of you know already, and uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, the Mexican part, which is uh, of Baja California. And uh, this is the most study region in the Mexican Pacific and in Mexico overall in terms of ocean acidification. It has over 20 uh, years of data. Uh, thanks to the IMECOCAL program, which is like the Mexican version of uh, the CALPOTI program. And this is uh, the place where it was uh, first shown uh, acidification in Mexican waters by a uh, very uh, Philly, which all of you know is the most cited paper in the world, I believe, in ocean acidification. And um, over in the central part, uh, you can see how uh, this water has a seasonal and annual and an interannual variability, which leads to uh, acidification, especially during uh, the, the spring. And over in the right, uh, the right part, uh, you can see uh, a work from Oliva Mendez, which uh, she showed in, in, in this one, she shows that uh, uh, this uh, acidified water with lower aragonite le um, saturation levels reaches the coast and uh, at depths that are much lower than uh, reported before in Ensenada, Baja California, and very near uh, the coast. Uh, aragonite levels reach 30, 30 and 20 meters in some places, especially during winter and spring, which is uh, when the uh, welling season is the strongest. Next, please. Next. And we have the Gulf of Canada. Uh, the, we don't have so many data in this region, but uh, it was the first that was measured in Mexico. And um, in here, I'm showing uh, what was made in the Umbrella area. We be uh, in this place uh, is uh, acidification is very strong, especially uh, uh, due to the strong tides that are happening in the Gulf of California, and the fact that uh, subsurface water is very rich in carbon and dissolving organic carbon, and therefore and very low in pH and aragonite. And we have a uh, pH levels of 7.5, reaching 20, 30 meters depth. This is one of the most acidified regions. Next, please. Uh, 
Okay, well, I didn't mention in the small map that is in the corners, we I, I plotted there uh, the most of the studies that have been uh, done. Uh, the region of uh, Imecocal is uh, in, of Calif Baja California is the most uh, sampled, and the rest of the Pacific is undersampled. And I want to make special emphasis in this region, which is the Mexican Tropical Pacific, because this is a region that uh, we consider a natural laboratory and change in acidification studies. In here, uh, we have an overlap of the warm water pool and the oxygen minimum zone, and therefore uh, the uh, carbon maximum zone. And it, we have a very strong stratification and the, the level of the subsurface water, which is, which is uh, the main source of carbon dioxide and low pH, is very shallow. We are talking between 50 and 30 meters depth. And uh, we are uh, in the figure of the, of the left, I'm showing you a picture that um, we have a TSD temperature salinity diagram. And uh, we have uh, how it relates to aragonites and oxygen levels. And we can see that this air that is very rich in carbon dioxide very low in aragonite levels is also very low oxygen. So we already have the conditions that we expect to have in the global ocean, in the, which is warm water, low oxygen, and low pH. And But also it's a very variable region because uh, it is affected by eddies, by tropical storms, all the through the sun. And, and this figure of uh, Ramon Sosa Avalos, I'm showing you how variable this uh, here uh, in the center is um, delta PCO2. And we can see that sometimes it's, it, it is mainly a source of CO2, but sometimes it becomes uh, a sink. But we still need to do this to fully understand this relationship, how, like how the intensity of it. Huh? Next, please. This, uh, uh, these are figures from uh, Itaí uh, de la Cruz in Cola, in et al. And this is uh, the central uh, Mexican tropical Pacific from Cabo Corrientes to uh, Guerrero in April to, to 2017 and to, to 2008. Carbon dioxide is of inorganic carbon dioxide and a pH. And in this region, especially Cabo Corrientes, which is at the northern part of the study area, uh, we have a uh, strong upwelling, especially in this month, April and May. And we can see how the level of pH drops in reach 20.8 at the surface. And therefore, uh, this is like the most acidified region. And Guerrero uh, is less acidified in this time but we have strong stratification and uh, poor ventilation of the surface water. This is an April and upwelling season, and summer when we have uh, the storm season, uh, and we have extreme produced stratification in the region as well. To the south, we have the Gulf of Tehuantepec. Uh, this region is has the same subsurface water, has the tropical surface water on top, has also the strong, uh, strong stratification, but the difference uh, compared with the other parts of the tropical Pacific is that during the wind season, which is on, on um, November to March, we have a uh, this past 20 meters per second and can uh, break the thermocline with a uh, mixed stone meeting and a wellings and also produce uh, mesoscale eddies in the top part of I, I'm showing you Winston's small climatology of December, January and February and we can see that it's very strong on, uh, on the Tehuantepec area in this region. I'm talking that uh, in 24 hours, 
Uh, this region could decrease up to Bristol to the strong winds. And in the center, I'm showing you a page surface in the surface and 20 meter deep. Uh, this is uh, from, we call it post season. It's April, uh, about at the end of the Tuano season, that winds are not so strong, but they still have the dynamics that was induced by the winds. And we have a strong uh, influence of uh, eddies, but also a very largely mixed area that produces this acidification that we can see in the right uh, panel. pH uh, reaches values of 7.8, about 30 meters depth, and aragonized saturation state uh, horizon is uh, reaches 30 meters deep in this region. As this uh, area has a very small uh, continental shelf, the oceanic conditions dominate in the coastal region as well in the lower part. We have a time series in a coastal um, area is a coral reef called La Entrega. And we can see that uh, we have acidification uh, occurring like hotspots. We have uh, pulses of acidification that are occurring, and we have the, we have the largest pH bar on September, but also the lowest ones because we have a very strong stratification. And in this region, coral reefs are distributed exactly from 30 meters to the surface. Next, please. Also, there is a strong season variability, uh, precisely because of the uh, November. Uh, we have, I'm showing you here, uh, the one season uh, pH in Aragonite, and also summer, June. Uh, in this, the main influence is due to storms in the lower uh, map. I'm showing you uh, uh, sea level anomaly, and the yellow, red, and white, uh, Sun, uh, marks are showing the trajectories of different uh, tropical storms and hurricanes and how they change as they push the water toward the coast and therefore we on uh, the coast to the the water with lower ph sinks they and are welling off the coast while well, during November, we have the opposite. We have very strong upwelling. In this case, we had uh, the Aragonite uh, horizon well, uh, reached five meters depth in the area where with the strongest uh, uh, influence of the wind. Next, please. Uh, the most of the studies that have been done in ocean acidification are uh, uh, oceanographic studies and much less uh, in biological effects, but it's uh, an area that is starting to grow. And we have, uh, our colleagues have uh, many projects ongoing. I'm just showing you some of them very fast, <laughs> please. The upper region, uh, there are two studies being published. Uh, the one uh, talks about uh, how uh, the sea or purple sea origin is affected by a uh, low pH, 7.7 uh, pH at the NFS scale. NFS scale. Uh, they decrease the classification of uh, their larvae. And Nemo has reached uh, 7.5. And in the case of Avaloni, there is a study that uh, found that um, uh, these organisms are not affected by uh, ocean by acidification, but they are affected by warming and hypoxia. Next, please. In coral reefs, there are more studies. Uh, most of them are ongoing. This is an unpublished uh, result of uh, Lopez Perez that is, is um, in process. And uh, they found that um, uh, 
uh, coral growth is uh, much has decreased over time. Also, in other work, I didn't put it here, but uh, there is a study that shows that calcification rates is much less, much lower in the southern Mexico than in northern Mexico. There is a, a gradient like, uh, to latitude and to aragonite saturation levels. And of in the, all the coral reefs in the Mexican Pacific, Quasilopora damicornis is the most abundant. It has been found to be most resistant and also to be able to uh, reproduce much better uh, via fractionation. Uh, which uh, can be a strategy uh, to survive in these regions. Next, please. As I say, there are a lot of ongoing projects. Uh, the bad news is we don't have many studies to be able to track the progression of fossil ocean acidification. We, in most regions, are at the level of identified what identifying what's going on and what is the natural variability of these regions to be able to afterwards uh, be able to track uh, acidification. And next, please. And now just to conclude, uh, most of the Mexican Pacific has been scarcely sampled. Only the Mexico region has enough data to affect on term acidification, but we're getting there. Strong effects in, just, in efforts in, year, in recent years will provide more information on pH viability and ocean acidification progression. And we still get how to identify anthropogenic carbon to be able to differentiate between natural variability and uh, anthropogenic variability. And that would be all. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Ceci. Our next presenter is Adrian Sutton. Adrian, I am now making you the presenter. You could go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Give me a second here. Okay. How does that look? Uh, your looks like your presentation is cut off. Hmm. Now we just see it as a, a window in a, a blue background. It still is cut off now. How is it cut off? Uh, we're only seeing the cartoon of that man uh, and a little bit of the title. Now we're only, yeah. Try pressing the presenter button on the bottom. Yeah. That works. Yep, we're all good. Okay. Take it away. Not sure what happened there. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and give a brief summary of the outcomes of a workshop that Jan Newton and I led back in February. And in that workshop, we focused on developing best practices for determining trends in ocean acidification time series and how to communicate those trends to our colleagues and stakeholders with the goal of doing that in a way that's much clearer than that cartoon here that I'm showing. Um, and a big thanks goes out to NOAA's ocean acidification program and um, go on for supporting the workshop. So this workshop was right before Seattle went into lockdown due to COVID-19. So we were very appreciative of our participants who traveled here and also very relieved when everyone got home safely. Um, we had 10 participants in person with some more jo joining um, via a rem remote session that we had. And we also had two guest speakers from outside the OA community to talk to us about best practices within their communities. So Peter Gator is one of a handful of statisticians who's been involved in the IPCC assessments and has spent a career working with climate data. And then Peter Tons 
uh, has been a leader in the atmospheric CO2 community for many years, uh, developing community-wide practices and um, determining rates of change in atmospheric CO2. So the charge of our workshop, that's shown here in quotes, was called out in the Go On Implementation Plan of 20, 2019. And this is timely given that ocean acidification is also a headline climate indicator for the WMO and seawater pH is a UN SDG indicator. So there are several global efforts that require our community to develop strategies for uniform analysis and dissemination of, of OA information. So our workshop focused on time series data. You can see by this figure of um, ship and fixed platform sites shown in the, in the Go On data portal that there are a lot, a large number of potential time series sites that could utilize community-wide best practices and in, in trend analysis. At the workshop, we talked primarily about sites that we know of that have been sustained over the last decade or more, and uh, most of those sites are shown here. And then we also considered regions like here in the Northern Caribbean Sea, where there are repeat observations from um, ship-based time series that could be used um, for time series analysis as well. So in our discussions with uh, Peter Tons, we learned about all the work that goes into developing what looks like this simple figure that we're all familiar with, um, the Mauna Loa Observatory time series trends. Um, and there are a few take home messages that are, are relevant to our best practices. So first, the atmospheric community has put a lot of time and effort into the use of standards that are analyzed by international metrology labs. So in order for us to be able to compare across our network, it's important um, to continue to put time and effort into doing the same with our CRMs and pH indi indicator dyes, for example. Another thing we learned is that the greenhouse gas community dedicates 25% of their time and funding on data quality control. This is a significant effort that many of us tend to underestimate in our own work. So it was really useful hearing from them exactly how much they put into that. The atmosphere community is also constantly reassessing their methods and best practices. So they do that on two year intervals. And we learned from Peter Gatorp that while linear and nonlinear trends are well constrained by statistics, the IPCC has made the decision to only report linear trends. And in order to develop those linear trends, the greenhouse gas community relies on statistical techniques for data gap filling. But the statistical techniques they use, like Fur Fourier harmonics, are not easily transferable to our data. Our data tends to be non-uniform, discontinuous, sparse, and has um, sources of uncharacterized variability. And lastly, while some open ocean time series are long enough to delineate the anthropogenic CO2 signal, um, there are very few coastal time series long enough to do so. This is something that Wiley mentioned uh, in his talk as well. So after those discussions, we decided to reframe the charge, really focusing on determining multi-decadal trends rather than delineating the anthropogenic CO2 signal, because many coastal areas have many other processes impacting the ocean carbon system, and it can be very difficult to delineate the anthropogenic signal from all of that noise. But there is still a need to understand change in coastal systems. So we need community-wide community practices for trend analysis. Okay, so we developed initial recommendations outlining 
uh, the broad sequence of approaches for determining trends. So the first step is to remove any well characterized periodic signal or signals from the time series. This is often described as deseasoning um, within our community. You see that term used a lot for removing the seasonal signal. Although this could also be applied to areas that have a well characterized daily signal too, that's periodic. Um, this figure on the right provides an example of what this looks like. So you're applying an adjustment to monthly means based on how the monthly climatology of the entire data set deviates from the annual mean. You then assess the linear fit of those resulting anomalies. And then you start to assess uncertainty and whether the resulting trend can be detected above the noise or variability in the data set. So this example, this equation here, um, takes into consideration the noise and the autocorrelation of the noise. And the final step is to propagate uncertainty, including uncertainty in the measurements and the trend analysis itself. Okay, so the way trends are reported is equally important as determining the trend. So we talked about the importance of characterizing the variability and explaining what the trend represents. For example, putting the trend in the context of a major climate forcing, for example, like ENSO or the Pacific Decadal Oscillation that may be impacting the trend. We also talked about the importance of knowing your audience. Are they interested in change in seawater pH or is it ocean acidity? Or do they not care at all about rates of change over time, but rather the point in time when a biological threshold will be exceeded? And then going back to what we learned from the greenhouse gas community, when we are calculating trends across a network of sites, it's critical we use data sets that follow community-wide best practices for measurements and data quality. Okay, so next steps with this work. We have an article in review summarizing many of the points that I've raised here. So hopefully you'll see that in EOS soon. Before finalizing recommendations and providing more detail to the community, we need to do some additional research on the best techniques for handling discontinuous non-uniform time series. Um, uh, you know, the, the statistical techniques that the atmospheric community won't necessarily work for us, so we need to do a little bit more work there. And that work will also be in partnership with statisticians, and we aim to seek input from the broader, broader community well beyond the few that we had at the workshop. So that's still work to come. And then what we hope is that the major outcome of this will be to publish an open access best practices paper, including the code for determining trends. And lastly, our go goal is to foster a community of practice around meeting regularly to reassess methods, much like the atmospheric community does. And this is my last slide. If you're interested in learning more about some of the information that informed our workshop, these three sources that are from uh, the WMO and NOAA are pretty easy to find online. Um, they're great um, background documents, talks a lot about all the techniques used to detect trends. Um, you can also email me, I'd be happy to send them to you. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. Our final speaker for today is Nina Benarsik. Nina, I've gone ahead and made you the presenter. You should be able to speak and uh, we could see your screen. Oh, perfect. Can you hear me as well? Yes, we could hear you loud and clear. Okay, wonderful. All right, uh, I'm gonna change gears after Adrian as well a little bit and actually talk more about biology. 
and um, trying to more conceptually think how we can combine chemical and biological observations and also how to include the uh, more, um, more precise anthropogenic impacts on the biological um, impact. Nika, right. before you get started, uh, we're just seeing uh, the view of your presentation um, as a regular PowerPoint. If you want to go ahead and make it full screen, that might be best. Okay, would that work? Uh, right now, that work? we're seeing your uh, your Chrome browser. So go back to your PowerPoint and uh, make it full screen for us. Mm. Is this working? No, we're just right now seeing uh, your your Chrome browser. Um, would you mind? Hey, hey, Mike, I think she's using two monitors. Is that correct, Nina? Yes. All right, so try dragging your presentation over to your other monitor. That causes some issues yes. at times. Here we go. Do you see this? Yep. And now oh. make it full screen. Sometimes it takes a little side. bit. Does this work? Uh, yeah. Uh, why don't you yeah? Just, yeah, travel to, over to the first yeah. slide and then you can make it uh, full screen if you press the, uh, the full screen button along the bottom uh, by the zoom uh, bar. Yeah, I already said have it full screen in here. So I'm not sure how this is going to work. All right. Do you see it in full screen now? No, we unfortunately aren't seeing it in full screen, but since we're running pretty low on time, why don't you just begin your presentation? Um, we could see the okay. screen pretty, it's it's lo definitely large enough for us to view. Um, so why don't you take I it actually, away? I have actually shared the screen with you and um, and before um, with, with your um, Helper, maybe you can pull out the screen because there are several different stuff presented there that I'd like the audience to see if you don't mind, please. Sure. In that case, yeah, give me a moment to pull up your presentation. All right. Um, do you see my full screen as your presentation, mm -hmm. Nina? Okay. Yes, yes. Excellent. All right. All right. Take it away and uh, just remember, try to keep it to 10 minutes uh, so we have time for a couple questions. Thank you very much. Go ahead. So, slide two, please. Okay. Um, so, we know that ocean acidification is changing marine habitats at the unprecedented rate. And such changes are projected to have profound impact on ecologically and important and economically important classifiers, their diversity and communities. And in, in fact, we know that a lot of this negative impact on the classifiers is already happening now. So this is not the case of the future scenarios. But because marine classifiers are so economically and ecologically important, the negative impacts can have important repercussions for the socioeconomic uh, perspective as well, either to food webs or ecosystem related services. And as such, accurate understanding and predictability of the current and near future responses of these marine classifiers to OA are of crucial importance. Next slide, please. So how do we think about the biological risk assessment? And here I'm using the, the concept of risk um, from the IPCC, and they're fo focusing here on exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So three components we need to understand in order to define the OA risks. And so when we're thinking about the exposure, we need to understand baseline natural variability, 
recognizing what is pertinent to a specific system, so for example, upwelling or estuarine dynamics. On top of that, we need to understand the trends and projections, uh, and all that comes together as an exposure. On the other hand, sensitivity uh, is actually quite complex, so we need to try strategically narrow it, narrow it down to the most sensitive biological processes that can have the capacity to induce population level bottlenecks. Because it's not just enough that we understand how one individual actually changes, but what are long-term population projections under OA. So in addition, life history matters because it helps with determining when and where the exposure would be the most severe, and also um, can be used pretty much as an early warning predictor. And then the third um, aspect is this adaptive capacity, and if existent on a population level, can leverage the sensitivity and then and that's why it's fundamental is studying uh, along with the sensitivity. Um, the adaptive capacity can be happening along with short or long-term trends uh, and it's often uh, determined by genetic variability. Um, in addition, there are multiple physical parameters that can facilitate population processes as well, like spatial connectivity, demographics, and this can all predetermine the capacity of the biological responses. So if we think about these three components, we can actually capture them in a framework when we even think about designing chemical and biological observations. Um, but how do we design such framework? So um, next. Yes, so our crucial question is how do we design such framework? All right, so um, here I'm just conceptually presenting the framework. And Please click one more button here. Um, for physical, chemical, uh, and biological observations with some common characteristics across habitats and scales of variability to maximize the observational efforts. And when we are thinking about this, chemical and biological observations have to be targeted in the context of chemical and biological relevance, of course, and integrated over relevant spatial, vertical, and temporal scales. Both biological and chemical, they have to be co-located in space and time, and they should really include multiple parameters. So for, from chemical perspective, all the physical parameters, all the biological, uh, um, all the chemical parameters in order for us to basically calculate how that's going to impact biological responses, which should also be taken across different levels of biological organization. And of course, these kind of observations should be habitat dependent and really accounting for the scales of variability from which we can then determine what the, the primary drivers of the biological res responses. And then lastly, uh, they should be taken in a way to, uh, to enable the detection and attribution of anthropogenic CO2 uptake and to be best correlated with these biological responses. This is especially important time-wise. Next click. So this is, uh, whenever it's possible, we should be coupling these observations with the biological experiments, which can provide the control and validation, also the metacosm work and no novel method development <coughs> to detect biological responses in the field, as well as multiple aspects of modeling efforts, as well as large data synthesis and threshold derivation. Because we, have, we are learning right now that thresholds can be used in modeling to pinpoint early warning temporal and spatial OA hotspots. All right, next one, please. So I am going to be uh, showing you a few case studies across different habitats um, where we are basically doing large-scale chem chemical biological observational efforts along the U.S. West Coast. We're doing that with NOAA PMEL and some regional efforts as well. And we'll go from the spatial offshore onshore gradients and into more coastal habitats of the California current system as well. And why, next slide, next click please. And why this is important is because regionally specific changes are often more relevant in the context of ecological responses than global averages. And here it's important not just to study the, the mean changes, but also the dynamic variability, and that means the frequency of the event, the duration, and so on. And of course, our primary concern is the rapid change, rapid rate of the uh, anthropogenic impact. Next click. Uh, we are studying marine calcifiers, theropods, and dungeness crab under such gradients, and we know that these organisms are already impacted. Next slide, please. 
So our first model OA organisms are theropods. These are shell pelagic snails. They're zooplankton. Their shell is made of aragonite, which is more soluble form of calcium carbonate. And they are really ideal sentinel species because they, they respond to the uh, OA very quickly. And because of their shell dissolution, they have this extreme sensitivity to uh, lower uh, aragonite saturation state. And so far, we have several lines of negative effects demonstrated um, on terabots, and all that became negative because of the I mean, uh, apparent because of the co-located chemical biological observations. And this allowed to investigate the drivers, the impact of anthropogenic CO2, multiple stressors, and different scales of variability. Next one, please. So in order to really start identifying the drivers, the timing, the spatial hotspots along this offshore onshore gradient for terabots, we have to focus on shell dissolution, shell calcification, stress biomarkers, and also survival. So just to make it clear, uh, all this was done in the field. So these are the responses in the field and then combined with the experiments in order to validate the field observations. What we know for shell dissolution and survival is that they closely correspond to integrated aragonite saturation state over 100 meter depth, um, which is vertical habitat of the theropods. And it's especially relevant over one to two months temporal scale of exposure. Quantifying shell dissolution against anthropogenic CO2 uptake also shows an increased shell dissolution from uh, 19 to 26% since the pre-industrial times. And uh, next click, please. Such responses are most relevant over seasonal scales uh, within this upwelling regime, and the most severe biological hotspots are in the coastal regions. On a population level effect, we're learning that temperature along with the OA um, is one of the most uh, important driver as well. So multiple um, parameters have to be taken into account. All right, next one. Next slide, please. Um, we are uh, now moving from terabots to dungeness scrap, in particular lateral dungeness scrap, uh, which can be now slowly considered an economic OA indicator along the US West Coast. Um, these dungeness scraps are perennially one of the most economically important fisheries, which is worth more than $300 million. And lateral crabs that exposed to OA in their um, vertical dial, vertical migrators, up to 100 meters or so, depending on the region. And what is really important to know is that uh, larval, larval stages make their exoskeleton out of the, out of the calcite, so that, that makes them potentially prone to dissolution. And they also have specific mechanoreceptors on the surface. They're important to detect environmental cues and also help them with feeding and locomotion. So encircled, this megalope is what we have focused on in our investigation. Next one, please. Uh, and next click. All right, so uh, as with the terapods, also for the Dungeness crab, trying to identify drivers, timing, spatial hotspots, and so on. Uh, in this coastal uh, habitat, we have basically focused on the exoskeleton dissolution. Um, and, um, and this is the image that you can see on the left. So they are basically, these crabs are already displaying the evidence of the severe exoskeleton dissolution, but this solution is also negatively related to the growth, and that makes this larval uh, crab smaller. We have also found out that mechanoreceptor loss starts to occur, and this is related to severe dissolution of the surface of the exoskeleton in which mechanoreceptor is basically anchored, and we don't know yet what sort of functional implication this uh, mechanoreceptor loss causes. By identifying the drivers, we really try a variety of different uh, analysis, and we discovered that the gradient in the calcite saturation state over 60 meter depth, which is their vertical habitat, um, and this is this delta calcite 60, from, and that means the difference between the surface and 60 meter depth, best explains severe biological responses. We also estimated that um, Anthropogenic CO2 uptake can cause 10% uh, increase in the solution since the pre-industrial times. And then uh, in addition with the observations, uh, integrated modeling efforts show that retention in this coastal habitat can actually have a role in exacerbating the negative biological impacts. Um, next slide. 
So uh, this is what we know from the biological responses coupled with the chemical observations so far. And there are so many next steps that we are following right now. We're trying to integrate the biodiversity and really detailed physiological in situ observations uh, using novel omics approaches. So for the biodiversity focusing on eDNA and epigenomics and from the physiology on proteomics and lipidomics and, and so on with some of the partners here that are also presenting. Um, the, the aim is, of course, not to try to analyze everything across this regional uh, uh, and large-scale observation. Uh, we also have to start focusing on how to get real-time monitoring in place and how to produce much um, higher, um, higher um, resolution biological observations. This is especially pertinent in the coastal regions and especially over the next um, a decade or so when these biological responses are going to um, get enhanced. So thinking about what sort of chemical observational platforms can we use for biological monitoring, for example, argofloats for the offshore sampling or gliders uh, to sample in the, in the coastal regions. We should be thinking how we can best use the moorings for higher resolution biological monitoring so these are existing chemical platforms that we are insufficiently using for the um, biological observations. And I understand that coupling a lot of biological sensors on these chemical platforms is sometimes difficult, but we can apply, for example, specific biological thresholds to observational data that are coming from, more, from moorings, for example, and we can get really high uh, resolution understanding um, of how of biological responses if we have such thresholds available and we are working really hard in order um, to get those impacts recorded. All right, uh, the last thing I want to mention is that we also have to thinking about fine scale variability and the drivers, especially again in the coastal regions where the dial uh, changes are really uh, important. We are learning more and more that not just the mean changes, but also the amplitude in the change of some minimum and maximum can have severe biological implications. And so having co-located biological and chemical observations in those habitats is absolutely crucial. And we also have to think of extremes and how we can use uh, thresholds in these settings, in these coastal settings with dial changes best in order to start understanding variability uh, with biological implications best. All right, email me if you have more questions. And we have so much results that are impossible to obviously get presented in 10 minutes, but I'll, I'll be very keen to, to respond with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that presentation, Nina. At this time, I am going to uh, ask uh, the audience to stick around for a couple more minutes for uh, just a couple questions. I, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that we did start our presentation a little bit late, um, but we still are over our one and a half hour time slot. So if any of the audience members can't stick around, don't worry. We're going to be um, posting this recording on the Go On YouTube channel um, sometime after OA week concludes. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to post them in the questions box, or you could tweet them at hashtag OA Week 2020, hashtag North American OA Hub, and at go on. Uh, we have three more sessions coming up tomorrow, the Arctic Hub, the OA Africa Hub, and the Latin American Hub. Um, and instead of taking any individual questions at this point, we will save all those questions and post them on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. And instead, we'll have uh, Dr. Dick Feely, the uh, co-chair of the North American Hub, uh, ask a few uh, ask questions a few of the panelists. Of the panelists. So, Dick, if you want, so, to, Dick, unmute if you want yourself, to unmute yourself. It actually does not look like Dick is on the call any longer. Uh, I'm not sure if he had another uh, event to attend to. Um, 
But since he's not here uh, and everyone is still around, uh, what I will do is ask a couple questions from the questions box um, for the next five minutes, and then we will wrap it up. So let's get started. So, this first question is for uh, Martin, and it's from Li King Jiang. He said, Hi, Martin. You mentioned you have carbon data measured in the Gulf of Mexico since 2010. I wonder if you have shared the data with some major data centers. Uh, yes, I can hear. Uh, yes, th this is the idea. The, the plans, as I mentioned, would leak uh, in, uh, in Oaxaca. Uh, the, the plan that we have as a hoops is to share the data that we have for, from Mexico to the, to the hoops. The, the answer is yes, of course. Great, thank you. This next question is for Wiley, and it comes from Katie Schamberger. She asks, do you ever see undersaturation water on the shelf today, or is it only in forecasts? Uh, Wiley, for some reason, uh, we're not able to hear you. I'm not sure if it's your headphones or what. Uh, we were able to hear you before. All right. Um, in the meantime, uh, I have a question for Adrian, and it comes from Carla Berghoff. She asks, could you please share some major uh, uh, tips for analyzing time series data um, that have quite a number of gaps? Thanks. Yeah, great, great question. And that's one thing that we're really have been struggling with is to develop some um, consistent techniques for that, that you could use across a variety of data. So the deseasoning technique that I showed with that figure from Taro Takahashi's paper in 2009, that's one technique. Um, if you have monthly data that um, you have over an entire time series, you can start to develop that climatology and figure out what your um, anomalies are and interpret between them. So um, his paper from 2009 would be a good one to, to start with on that. Great, thank you so much. This next question comes from Matthew Liebman and it's for Nina. The question is, how do we know that the pteropods that sink are getting more corroded in the field? I've just um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, basically, we are taking a variety of different samples from different um, gradients from the offshore to the onshore and having that uh, control from the experiment plus over the large scale gradient, especially, uh, we are able to determine where specifically they are dissolving or not. And so, we are taking the, the samples, we are preparing them, and then scanning them under electron microscopy microscope and determine the level of dissolution in their shell. Thank you very much, Nina. Uh, Wiley? Uh, Wiley? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks, Michael. I think the question was, have we observed undersaturated water over the shelf today? And the answer is yes. Um, in fact, uh, the paper that was brought up uh, by CC earlier uh, from Dick Feely uh, from one of the earlier West Coast OA cruises talked about um, the occurrence of undersaturated water over the continental shelf along the West Coast of North America. So, and that was in 2008. I think the cruise was in 2007. So, yes, we, we've definitely observed those conditions.
Thanks, Wiley. I've muted you. Uh, there's some feedback coming through on my end when you're unmuted. So I um, will mute you for now. Uh, and this next question is for Piero, and it comes from Denze uh, Nechintungalu. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but Piero. Um, the, uh, the audience member asks, are there any methods used on the ecological impacts on the surrounding area in terms of the populations of shrimp and lobsters to keep it balanced? Method to keep it balanced? Um, in which sense, sorry? Uh, maintaining, maintaining population level uh, unaffected by fishing, environment? It's unclear from the question, but let's go with all of it. Oh, okay. So uh, certainly for what concerns Canada, there are um, early, early like survey that the Department of Fishery and Ocean in different regions and any in integrated effort conduct to look at the state of the stocks, for example, for what concerns uh, the northern shrimps in particular. I, I know the work uh, and have assisted the discussion quite closely. And what they do is actually to assess the stock level, the stock condition to set quota for the year. Um, and this is actually based on, on multi-annual survey that conduct in different locations and establish the quota. Uh, for the shrimps in some locality, the quota have reduced enormously in the last four years. I've seen you know, the quota going down to a fraction of what they were like four or five years ago. Um, so there, re there is a system in place to maintain catch potential in the population. Uh, but of course, like this is, this is to do with the, the more year by year management. Uh, whilst the work we've been doing also in collaboration with DFO, try to provide a global change integrated prediction on what could happen to the stocks. The two things are not in, in, in conflict, but they could become more and more complementary in a way to refine, refine stock assessment and stock management. So hopefully I've answered the, the question. For what concerned a lot of the survey conducted, for example, in the method used by the, the Rick Wallace lab that put down KJ with stones to try to see how many juvenile are recruited in a year. Uh, and, and this is done both in the in the Gulf of Maine area by Rick Wally and also on the East Coast, uh, sorry, on the Canadian side by uh, other colleagues here in, in New Brunswick, for example. And so it's used as a way to assess uh, the population um, condition and, and, and therefore regulate fishing, I guess, uh, accordingly. So there are methods, but necessarily the method don't integrate the single global changes. This can only be done for now on modeling exercise. The two should, should be merged and integrated. Thank you very much, Piero. I think you've uh, answered the gentleman's question. Uh, and the uh, last question we'll, we'll share today is for Ceci. And it is, are there any uh, uh, monitoring cruises scheduled for the west coast of Mexico um, over the next couple months or the next year? Uh, there was one, uh, sadly, uh, with the coronavirus crisis. Uh, all uh, activities were uh, rescheduled, hopefully for the next year. But uh, there is one schedule by, uh, there, there was one that was going to be uh, carried out in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, part of the tropical uh, Mexican Pacific by uh, Inapesca. Uh, but it was going to be last May, but they changed it. Uh, they still don't know when, but hopefully it will be by next year and uh, most of the resources that were going for research now are going for uh, health issues. And I think that is uh, something happening all around the world, sadly. All right, so at this time, uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Thank you so much for uh, presenting your work and for uh, joining us for Ocean Acidification Week. Uh, I also would like to thank all the audience members for logging on and sticking around, even though we went a little over time. And I wanna encourage all the audience members to check out some of the other sessions of Ocean Acidification Week. And uh, let's continue the conversation on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. Again, all of the questions that we didn't get to will be posted there after this talk. And this talk will be posted on the Go On YouTube channel sometime over the next week or so. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I'll see you during session four tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.